go. Good morning. When I agreed to do this talk, I didn't know it was going to be a historic day. So happy Juneteenth to everybody. Um, celebrating freedom from slavery for all. Unfortunately, it also didn't include freedom from drought. So um, today we are going to talk about how to effectively water during the drought, getting to the root of all that there. And um, I just wanted to start just in case you aren't familiar with who Master Gardeners are to tell you a little bit about who we are. We are trained volunteers. Uh, we've been trained by the University of California's Cooperative Extension to be part of their volunteer arm. And our job is to provide Marin residents with research-based information on all the various areas of plant health and gardening practice, horticulture, pest management, and earth-friendly landscape practices. In um, a lot of the University of California Agricultural and Natural Resources publications over the years, they have an old adage that goes along the lines of successful gardeners are ones who fertilize adequately but not excessively. They irrigate thoroughly but not too frequently. And they promote good soil structure by mixing organic matter into the soil and minimizing tilling when the soil is wet. And today we're going to talk predominantly about the irrigating thoroughly. But a little bit about the other two before we get going. You're going to really want to minimize the amount of fertilization you do during the drought period. When you fertilize, you ask the plants to you give them all these nutrients and say, hey, go out and grow, get bigger. And really what you want them to do is not put out all that excessive growth this year because that excessive growth needs a lot of water to build it and to maintain it. You, you do want to promote good soil structure by mixing in organic material into the soil. And maybe the best way to do that is to use a compost uh, mix as your mulch and be lazy. Don't work it into the soil. Let nature do it for you. Let the earthworms and all those little microorganisms in the soil do it for you. I like being a, a lazy gardener and you should like that too. Less work for you. Okay, so today we're really going to focus more on that irrigation part of things. Um, and back to the soil again, by putting in compost uh, into your soil and organic material, that's a really good thing for helping to conserve water in the soil because it helps the soil hold on to the moisture and, and absorb the moisture that you're putting into the soil much better as well. So that really can help us decrease the amount of irrigation that you need as well and how frequently you need to do it. Now, Right now we're experiencing um, a, a mega, we're in the mega, uh, the beginning of a mega drought. And California, I mean, we're, we're used to droughts. We get them every summer. We have a drought in the summer and then we get winter rains, typically. Um, in the mega drought, we're not always getting all that winter rain or we're getting deluged, one or the other, but not always getting as much as we normally would. Our climate change models uh, indicate that the conditions we've seen in some of the recent years are a little more about what we'll continue to get for, uh, as time goes on. The models are telling us that the average amount of rainfall that we get may be similar to what our historical average has been. However, how and when we get it will be a bit different. We'll tend to get it in the shoulder seasons, which means more like getting it in November and December, and then having drier Januaries and Februaries, and then maybe wetter Marches and Aprils. May even like last year, it went into May, which was very unusual being so wet and cold. Um, but, when we have longer periods of drought and we get these 
really strong storms that come in and we don't get the long, slow drizzles, uh, the storms tend to put down water so fast that a lot of it runs off. But if you're putting organic material into your soil, you can help it absorb more water um, as it does. But the higher runoff also means that it's harder for the water to soak in and it's harder to get those groundwater aquifers replenished. And that's the problem we're at right now. We've, we've over the last 10 years, most of those years have been in drought. We've only had one or two kind of wet winters. And so our groundwater is, is getting pretty well depleted. So uh, this year, uh, we're coming in with that depleted groundwater supply and reserves. So we're in drought mode. What's a gardener to do here? Well, it, during drought periods, what we're going to work hard to do is in our garden is we want to save the structural garden elements um, that require long establishment periods. We're talking trees, uh, shrubs, rare plant specimens. These are all plants that take a number of years to become established. I mean, trees don't always get very, look like they've been there until they've been there about seven to 10 years. Some shrubs take about that long to really start looking like they're mature specimens as well. So you're going to want to work hard to put water down to save those kinds of things that can't be easily replaced or quickly replaced and that are the ones that form the bones of your garden. So you are going to be willing to, you should be willing to sacrifice elements that can be quickly replaced, things like grass. Yes, grass can be a little expensive to replace, but within about a month, if you had water again, you could have a grassy area up and looking really nice. It's not, it doesn't take years to do that. But we're not even recommending that you think about grass, even in the long term, because it just takes so much water. And we are a summer dry climate that really doesn't support that kind of a landscape. And we want to use our reduced water resources that we have the most effectively and efficiently. So today we're going to be talking about how to do this so that you can have a, a good looking garden, even though it may be a pared down garden. Um, we are going to be working hard to uh, help you find some ways to deep water and one of the things you're going to need to do out here is to make sure that your irrigation system is in good shape. You're wanting it to be putting down the right amount of water, not too much, not too little. So you're going to want to make sure your irrigation emitters are placed in the right places, that there aren't leaks out there. And there's a lot of ways that your irrigation could be having problems that maybe you're not being really aware of. Um, your emitters may be clogged. They may not have been uh, moved out to the canopy drip line as the plant grew because the roots that take up the, the water and the nutrients tend to be out at the edge of the canopy drip line. Over time, many of those emitters clog. They either get dirt in them or um, during after they quit putting out water the, and it dries, the little calcium or other mineral deposits clog them up. Or one of the things happens is that over time, all the water going through this plastic tends to erode the emitters from the inside out. They still are there. They're still putting out water. They're just putting out water at a higher rate than they are supposed to be putting it out. So they may need to be replaced so that you're only putting out the amount of water that needs to be put out. And then there are those that help you with your irrigation system or they think they're helping themselves. It's these little guys. They're out there often, uh, they're hungry and they're thirsty as well. 
and they're looking for that water source. So uh, I've had a number of irrigation uh, things that I've had to go out and fix thanks to gophers. I've had problems with rats. I'm sure some of you are having problems with squirrels. So it's not like just getting your irrigation tuned up in the spring and thinking, ah, I'm done for the summer, great. You know, you need to be getting out there and looking at it on a fairly regular basis to make sure that you're not having additional problems that need to be taken care of. I was just doing that this morning and I think I've got about four places out there that need some irrigation fixes. That's on my agenda for later today. Thankfully, it's not as hot. Um, watering our gardens during drought to make them still look good doesn't necessarily need, mean that it has to be more water. Um, it needs to be probably less water than what we've been uh, dealing with. And we just want you to put it down and apply it more efficiently the water that you are putting down so that it keeps these plants alive. So let's talk about that. This diagram shows that where the roots are in your soil and for the full depth of roots on any plant, approximately 40% of those roots are in the top quarter of the root depth. 70% of those roots are in the top half of the depth of all the roots. And you've got 70% three quarters of the way down. And that last quarter are only 10% of those roots typically on plants. Now that the how far down those roots go depends on the type of plant, the type of soil. Um, but Approximately 70% of the water that is taken up by any plant comes from those 70% of the roots that are in the top half of the root zone. That's where they're pretty much taking in the water that they and nutrients that they need every day while they're going through the photosynthesis photosynthesis and evapotranspiration process. And um, so that's where we're going to focus on getting water to is that top 70% of the roots. During the daytime, these roots work by pulling all the soil moisture up from below and left and right or side to side, whatever you want to say and then pumping it up through the root system into the leaves and expiring it out. And uh, this process is known as evapotranspiration. So since they're getting about 70% of their uh, moisture, they're pulling it out of the top half of their root zone, it seems to most people that you'd have to water that area a whole lot more, maybe every day if they're using it all, and uh, you'd need to irrigate more. You'd think that would be the case. And normally when I make this presentation in person, I see almost everybody there nodding. And But the answer is no, you don't need to do it every day because it turns out, who knew, that plants work really hard at night too. Although they aren't photosynthesizing and their evapotranspiration process really drops down to very little, they are still busy working. These roots are bringing the moisture that is farther down up all night long, and then they are pushing it out into that top 70% of the root zone so that it can be stored there so that they can easily access that the following day when they need to quickly access water because it takes it longer for them to bring it up from the lower depths. We call the plants that do that the heavy lifters and for the most part these are the trees and the bigger shrubs. So any nearby plants to your trees and shrubs tend to benefit from having the trees and shrubs there as well with these heavy lifters that are up there. So um, 
how do, deep do all these roots go? Well, that's the next question. That's where we're going next. So typically turf, ground cover, and bedding plants tend to have their roots down six to 12 inches. Shrubs tend to keep their roots down 12 to 24 inches, and then trees 18 to 36 inches. So if you got water down to where you really wanted it to be, you'd get the water down about that deep as well. You know, uh, some of our vegetable plants and other plants that you would think are uh, not, they're not trees, they're not shrubs, but they tend to, some of them put their roots down a lot deeper too. Tomatoes would love to have their roots down closer to four feet. Corn, Many of the native type grasses tend to put their roots down that deep. Think of the dust bowl in the 40s. The reason it occurred, people ripped out all those native grasses that anchored the soil. Those roots on those, when they went back and studied them, they found the roots of those plants, those native grasses, to be down eight feet or more. So they went searching for water. So how deep do you need to water to get your plants to stay healthy? Well, let's talk about that. So I'm gonna give you some examples that we had come into the help desk several years ago when we were in that five year chunk of drought before the last wet winter we had. And about halfway into that five year period, I was working at the help desk one day and there was a man that came in. He had a tree that had been there for quite a while in his backyard. It had lawn planted all underneath it. And he brought me pictures. He was trying to figure out what was wrong with it. His tree just wasn't looking good. And I looked at his pictures and I said, wow, the tree really looks like it's water stressed. It needs more water. And he looked at me and he said, oh, no, it can't it can't be needing more water. It's getting watered several times a week when I water the lawn. You know, it, it, I've watered it this way for years. No, that can't possibly be it. And about that time, our staff horticulturist walked through the office and I said, hey, what do you think? Here's the pictures he's got. What do you think is wrong with this tree? And he looked at it and he said, I think the tree looks water stressed. I think it needs more water. And the guy just he looked at us really funny. And so we finally said, okay, we want you to go home and we want you to do an experiment for us and call us back. And if we are right, there's a pretty easy fix. And if we're wrong, then it's something that's by far more serious and it's gonna take a lot of work to figure out what it is. So we want, you, it's probably, you know, some kind of a root disease or something. And we hope it's the easy fix, but we want you to go home and do an experiment for us. So the experiment we asked him to do is to go out and take his shovel and go out to the edge of the canopy. So I'm using my little pointer here to show you the edge of the canopy. We call that the canopy drip line. Over here, it would be here. And we asked him to put his shovel in the ground and push the bl spade blade down as far as he could get. We figured he could maybe get it down close to a foot. And not to dig the soil, but just to push that shovel blade back and forth a little bit so that he had a little wedge that he could put his fingers in. And then we asked him to use his built-in moisture meter. And I'm talking here, your fingers. They are very sensitive. They are one of the best moisture meters that you can have. And we asked him to reach his fingers down in that little opened up wedge and feel the soil and tell us how deep that moisture went. And if it was moist like a well wrung out sponge all the way down to the bottom, then it was something other than what we thought. If it was only moist an inch or two down, then it was in need of more water. It really needed to get water down to the root zone because the roots that were taking up the nutrients and the water 
just weren't getting it because they, you know. So he went home and he did the experiment. And about an hour later, he called us back. And he said, oh, you guys were so right. The moisture only went down between one and two inches. So how do I fix this? So we suggested he go out to his local hardware store or his local nursery, someplace that he could get some of those big soaker hoses. And he could then lay them out, out here near the edge of the canopy drip line and turn, attach them to his hose and faucet and turn the faucet on very low and let that soak for several hours and move the hose around so that everywhere under his canopy drip line got, you know, in water for several hours and then wait several hours and then go out and check it again using that spade test. And if the moisture was all the way down to the bottom of the opened out wedge of soil, then he had probably enough moisture for it to do okay. He was probably getting the water deep enough. But if it didn't get down that deep, then he needed to water more until he did. So it would be a series of tests to determine when you need to do it. But you need to go out and do that little test a number of hours after you've watered, not right after you've watered because we have a lot of clay soils here and it takes a while for the water to percolate. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. Another example from that same summer occurred in a garden in Ross on a slope. This person had a, a hedge that was along a slope and at the bottom of the, the slope the hedge was doing really fine. Her neighbors had had an irrigation leak earlier in the summer and that was where all the water had collected. It had lots of nice, nice moisture in the soil, but the, the part of the hedge that was higher up the slope, it was having a lot of problems. So we asked her how you know, much irrigation she was giving it. And she says, well, you know, I'm watering it every day for about 10 minutes. And it, I just, it's, we're in a drought. I can't put any more water down. I'm, I'm really concerned and I'm trying to save my hedge. And so I said, well, I think these all look like they're water stressed and they need more water, but I can't do that. I, so I'm not asking you to put more water, use more water than you're using now. I'm asking you to use the water that you have wiser and do your irrigation a little bit differently. So what I suggested that she do, instead of watering the 10 minutes or 20 minutes that she was doing every day or every couple of days, I asked her to do her hedge irrigation, irrigate it once a week for about an hour, do that all in that 24 hour period. And given that she was on a hillside, I said she may have to do this in several small cycles so that she didn't have water runoff. And most irrigation systems are set up to be able to do this. So what you do is you, you water for a little bit, you stop, let it soak in, you turn, have the irrigation system come back on, you irrigate a little bit more, you stop, let it soak in, and you do it again. So a lot of times it takes two or three cycles to do it so that there isn't runoff or ponding on the surface. And But it's important that that gets all done within a 24 hour period so that the water really soaks in and gets down to the depth that you need to get it deep enough to. And that should solve the problem. Well, we never heard back from her, so I think it probably did solve the problem because we had asked her to call back if that didn't work. And yet later that summer, we had another similar type of thing come in, type of question. This person lived in San Rafael and they had a hedge that was 25 to 30 years old. And this person had been hand watering their hedge this whole time period. 
they they did it every day that's how the how the hedge got water and but it was looking mighty sad and this was october and so we asked her about how she watered on hand watering well that's usually a clue to me right away somebody tells me they're hand watering they're probably not watering long enough to get the water down deep enough because nobody wants to stand there for 20 minutes and hold the hose to put enough water down to get the water down about a foot so she didn't believe me so i finally said okay well the only way i can have some master gardener come out and look at your hedge is uh let's let's schedule a garden walk for you and so we did that and the garden walk person uh, said you know we're done for this season it's late october i'll just call her up and see if i can stop on my way home so she made arrangements to do that. But in the meantime, I've asked this woman, have any other conditions changed? You know, have you done any construction that might damage the roots or your neighbors? Nope, nope, nope. Okay. So our garden walk person goes out there and our garden walk person gets to her house and has the hardest time trying to park on her street because there's a lot of construction going on. There's been apparently a broken sewer main or a leaky sewer main that is being repaired. And they are just about finished up. They've got the line replaced, but you know what? We figured that what happened is that hedge had, had sent its roots out far and wide looking for moisture over the years because she wasn't giving it very much hand watering. It was building a very good, extensive, healthy root system. But during the drought, when we had had groundwater sources start to dry up, and then when the leaky sewer main was, got replaced and was all its nutrients and water that it had found were suddenly taken away, it was having problems. So we think that solved the problem there. She was just going to have to irrigate more because it was no longer getting not only water and moisture from the leaky sewer, but it was not getting more, uh, nutrients either. So, okay, those are some of the examples of things that we've, we've had at the help desk. I want to also give you a quick word about watering under oaks. Typically, we tell people not to water under oaks. Oaks have evolved here in California with the winter wets and the summer dries, and they tend to not like getting water in the summer. It tends to promote root fungus for them. But this year, maybe they hadn't had enough water going into the summer, given that our water groundwater sources are somewhat depleted and that we have had in general less than half of what our normal rainfall is. And remember, normal rainfall is just the average amount of rain that you get typically in a year. We very seldom get the normal amount. We either get more or we get less and it averages up to that normal amount, but we seldom get normal. And so with the oaks, this year, you, if your oak trees start looking a little bit sad in the middle of the summer, you may need to give them one deep soak. And if you do, we suggest this be done like how we had talked about before, putting a soaker hose out at the canopy drip line and giving it one good long soak, maybe at about the end of July, the beginning of August, and then don't give it any more. And unless we, and if we don't get the rains in October, you may need to give it a soak then. And then keep giving it one monthly soak, deep soak, until the winter rains come. If the rains don't come in the winter, do that every month through the winter, through March, and then don't water anymore until the following October, if you've done this regimen. We call this watering in the winter for these kinds of plants, native plants like this, faking the rain. So, 
Okay, let's go on and talk about how to help your plants build that healthy root system so that they can absorb, find that water and uh, uh, use it. So if you water, what you're really wanting to try and do is help those roots develop a, a deep, extensive root system. If you shallow water and frequently water, the roots don't have any incentive to go looking for anything, especially if you fertilize too. Everything is right there and it's right there in the top couple of inches of soil. So why do they have to work hard to, to go any place to get find any of that? They don't. So they tend to put out a dense set of roots that are really close to the surface and very few that come down. These plants like this cannot um, withstand any kind of drought conditions. One day of not getting water and they're kind of sad. They might even die from that a couple of days. If you water deeply but frequently, the roots will go down deeper, but they don't develop very thickly. They, they still are pretty sparse because everything's still right there. They don't have to go forage. But if you do it deeply, but not too frequently, you get this really nice, dense root system. And that's really what you're wanting to do. You really want to do this kind of watering even when we are not in drought. It uses water more efficiently. It helps the plants develop their root system the way they should so that they can better withstand drought when you get it. Or a, you know something that happens to your irrigation system, it gives you some grace and, and keeps them healthier as well. Makes them more resilient, which is exactly what you want them to be. So how much water do you need and how often do you need to do it? Well, that all depends on, on your soil conditions here. So this is the part of the lecture when I then ask people if I'm doing this presentation in person, um, how many of you have sandy soils? And if I'm doing this in person, I see nobody in the audience raise their hand. And then I ask how many people have clay type soils and most everybody in the, res the audience uh, raises their hands. And I ask people how many people like their clay soil and almost nobody raises their hands. This is where I say you need to love to learn your clay soil. Uh, clay has a lot of benefits. It does have some challenges. Uh, the benefits are that it holds a lot of moisture and it carries a lot of nutrients, a lot of micronutrients with it, that if you work with it, your plant can access that and help them be he healthier. Um, think of it this way and, and how, why it helps hold the moisture here better. With the sandy soils, I know many of you have been to the beach before, and if you think about that sand, think about picking up some sand in your hand and really looking at it. You can look at it and see every single grain that is there. You can tell that those grains are kind of round. So think of those if you magnified them and put them in a clear glass that you could look at them. Replace those grains of sand in your mind with like ping pong balls in this clear big vase. And if you poured water in, it would just go right through it really quickly because, hey, there's so much space between all those ping pong balls. Well, clay is a lot different. It's microscopic in size. Think the difference between the sand particles that you can see and how little and round they are, but you can still identify them all. And then think about putting some talcum powder on your hand and how fine those little grains are. You can't see them, they're so tiny. But unlike talc, clay is kind of flat. 
And so, and in your soil, they're all in their cattywampus. They're in all kinds of different directions. So that allows them to drain differently than the sandy ones do. Gravity just pulls the water through very little sideways capillary action uh, when you've got a sandy soil going on. With clay type soils, the water, it, it's so tensely, densely packed that the water drains mostly by capillary action, spreading it horizontally and also has some gravity pull, but it takes a lot longer for gravity to do its work than the capillary action, moving it from side to side. So if you look at these charts and where the zero is under the sand here, this is where the emitter would be. And in 15 minutes, the water gets down to a depth of 12 inches. In 40 minutes, it gets down to three feet. In 60 minutes, it's a little over 50 inches. And it takes 20, uh, sorry, um, uh, sorry, 72 hours, I'm sorry, 24 hours to get to a depth of 72 inches, six feet. So um, it, it takes, uh, you know, only 24 hours to get down that deep. And in the time that this has been going on, at its maximum, it's spread 12 inches either side of the emitter. So it's pretty much coming just straight down on the emit where you'd place your emitter here under the clay soil, it takes four hours to get down to 24 inches, 24 hours to get down to 36 inches or three feet. And it takes two days to get down to the 72 inches. And at the same time, it's spread out to 30 inches either direction as it's been doing this. So this helps you get a picture for how far apart you need to space your emitters when you're in clay soil, knowing that they are gonna be basically taking up, you know, what, wherever you put your emitter, you've got almost six feet, five to six feet of soil that is getting uh, wetted by the one emitter. So this sort of helps, you know, people to understand the concept of what we call hydrozoning, why you want to put plants that have similar water requirements all close together. Because otherwise, if you're putting down, a, this plant here needs uh, a lot of water and right next to it, there's the one that's really, really dry. And there's another one over here that something, needs something else you know, one of them's gonna end up with too much water and one's gonna end up with not enough water because of how the capillary action works and the amount of water putting down here. So you may not need as many emitters. So maybe your emitting emitters are not set up exactly the way you need to do. So you need to look at that and um, you're, you're gonna have to figure out whether you need to adjust your emitters some more. Maybe spread them out a little more. Maybe use less number of emitters. So, okay. So how frequently do you need to do the watering? Well, again, it depended a lot on your soil type. If you've got sand here and you have watered to a depth of 18 inches, you can go about a week between watering before it need to, well, to get it down for one foot, you, you go about five days in between watering. With uh, clay soils, which is this line here and the window, the red area here, pretty much is what most of garden soil in Marin has become, especially if you've been a good gardener and amending it with things like compost. And if you're watering down to a depth of 12 inches, you can get by with maybe watering every 14 days, maybe even close to 20. 
but maybe doing it about every 10 days if you have to you know get down more than six you're pretty good so maybe you've been watering maybe a little too frequently you could probably go to almost once every two weeks for a lot of your things that you're trying to water out there so uh, especially if you're going with these longer deep soaks that are getting the water down to 12 inches or more in the soil. So that really um, helps with, you know, how we're doing on that aspect. So I wanted to talk also a little bit here about fruit trees, because I know a lot of you have fruit trees and trying to keep your fruit trees safe during drought is a very important thing to do. So depending on how often you're gonna to need to water them will depend on what kind of rootstock they have. This is a diagram from the Marin Master Gardener, California, the California Master Gardener Handbook. And tree A here on the left is a standard size fruit, fruit tree on standard rootstock. So it has nothing controlling how uh, its growth at all. Um, it typically tends to get 30 feet high thereabouts. Its roots tend to go out well below three feet deep and over you know 30 feet wide. And so that you know it, it ha it's very able to withstand drought, especially if it's getting good irrigation as well. Tree B here is a semi-dwarfing root stock. And what it does is it limits the smaller rootstock, allows it to uh, limit the amount of nutrients coming up into the tree. And because it's got limited nutrients, it tends to be a smaller tree topping out a little over 20 feet high. C would be more of a semi-dwarf variety of plant a tree and again it has a smaller root stock. You notice the roots go down less deep and the tree gets a lot smaller and then uh, D is a, a standard tree that has been planted onto, grafted onto a semi-dwarf root stock and so you know it wants to be the, the, the the plant rootstock really wants to be up here like the tree A, but um, its rootstock is limiting its size to a canopy that only gets to the size that it's shown here and is in tree D. So when you do that, you notice its roots are a lot more shallow. These trees are not very drought tolerant. They need very frequent, very regular water. And they are very unforgiving of having their moisture. They want a very even soil moisture. They're not particularly forgiving and they're not drought tolerant. So they're gonna need to be irrigated quite frequently. So how do you keep that moisture in the soil as long as possible? And that is with mulch. So with uh, Mulch, you can use almost anything, but in general, uh, good gardeners want to put something down that is going to help build their soil. So they're usually wanting to put some kind of organic material down. It can be things like different types of wood chips and things like that. And uh, as a gardener, I like to use compost because it's already broken down quite a bit and it's helping to build my soil, doing my lazy gardening method, letting the earthworms and other soil critters uh, do the churning for me and working it in. And in Master Gardeners, we say, you know, doing this, it, our mantra often is mulch, 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 compost, compost, compost. It really helps build the soil, it helps the soil absorb and retain moisture a lot more. It helps putting a couple of layers, inches layer on the top, keeping it pulled out away from the root stems, trunks, um, keeps disease from uh, wanting to get in there. And it also helps keep those roots a lot cooler and helps your plants become more drought, stay more drought tolerant. But it's also important these days 
to do your mulching with fire safety in mind. You do not want any kind of flammable or combustible mulch or plantings five feet within five feet of structures. So the fire department would like this picture even better if there were no plants in that gravelly uh, mulched zone here because they're too close to the house. The embers hit the house, fall down and find any debris and then spark and that's what creates problems catching houses on fire. So they really would like it if you didn't have uh, flammable mulches within 30 feet of houses. That's a little unreasonable in small suburban yards. We ask you to do the best you can, but putting a clear zone of five feet around your house works best. And some of the things that you can mulch with in that five foot zone are things like rock, paving so stones, or compost, because compost is already broken down. The flammable material, there's very little tinder there to, to uh, harbor and help those embers along into becoming flames. So it's a very important thing to keep in mind. So in summary today, what we've learned is we should use our limited resources the most effectively and efficiently we can, you know, make sure we're getting the water to only the plants that we are working hard to save, that we are watering deeply and uh, efficiently and we are tuning up that irrigation system to make sure there aren't leaks or worn out emitters or uh, keeping uh, repairs done when we've had those uh, pesky little critters uh, finding water in our irrigation system. We're working hard to stay, save our structural plants and those requiring long establishment periods and sacrificing those that can be easy, easily replaced. Maybe it means rethinking your landscape. I know that's what I've been doing. You're gonna water deeply, less frequently, so that you're developing a denser and deeper root system that's more drought tolerant. Most plant roots are in the top one to two feet of soil. So if you can get your water down to one foot and hopefully even a little bit more, then you can, are probably gonna be saving your, your, your larger structure plants. And you might need to be able to, you might be able to do that once every one to two weeks. If you mulch, you'll help retain moisture in your soil a whole lot longer. It also protects it from a lot of evaporation, not just from the sun, but from the wind as well. And using non-flammable mulches against your uh, structures is a very smart practice to do. Remember, successful gardeners fertilize adequately, but not excessively. Irrigate thoroughly, but not too frequently. And they promote good soil structure by mixing organic material into the soil and minimizing tilling when wet. I want to give you a couple of resources that we've used for uh, this presentation. Um, the first one is Watering Guidelines. This was written by our staff horticulturist. It talks about a lot of the things that we've, we've mentioned here. It talks about how to determine what kind of soil, soil you have with some easy quick tests that you could do and how to determine how deep that water is going, kind of like using the shovel method that we had talked about in some of the examples. Um, the mulch brochure that I showed a, uh, a pictures of from there is this one shown here, over here, uh, right here. This is the best mulch brochure I have found. And it, uh, it's both of it and the Soil Matters one down here. This is a wonderful uh, brochure as well. It's got a large section in the center of it that shows you all the different critters that live in your soil. Remember soil's alive and it's got a lot of things in it that make it alive and that's what you as a gardener want is a very you know thriving living soil and all of these are online. The mulch and the soil matters one are you can access both from our website 
And the watering guidelines one here is on the UC Cooperative Extension um, website. I have given uh, Franklin a copy of this slide so that he will be sending it out to you with a link of, for the video presentation here after they get it posted. So uh, you'll have these slides um, and the links easily so you don't have to try and write them down right now. Um, other ways that you can stay in touch with Master Gardeners uh, Leaflet. It's our Master Gardener Ease newsletter. It just came out in the last couple of days. This is the new one here. Um, you can sign up for it on our website. We have garden walks offered by Master Gardeners coming out to give you advice on irrigation practices and water-wise plants. I will warn you that right now we do have a bit of a backlog because we had quite a full list going into last year and then we were shut down. So we're, they're working on that first, but get your name on the list. And if you're interested in becoming a Master Gardener, applications are now available online. We will be uh, opening our training back up this year. Training is about 18 weeks. It goes from January into early May and uh, can train you to become a Master Gardener volunteer as well. And uh, of course, there's the help desk. The help desk will be reopening in person for in-person visits on July 6th. Um, right now, through the pandemic, we've been working only by email. And uh, if you've written to us, you may know that it's been taking a little while to get responses. It's because our volunteers are rather pandemic weary, just like you are as well. So we're in the process of slowly opening back up and we expect to be fully reopened by July 6. So that concludes, concludes my presentation here today. Remember, we are the Master Gardeners, whoops, and uh, we offer advice to grow by, so ask us. So, so we do have a few questions, um, Lois. So the first one was, um, Someone that uh, Sharon asked, please address those of us without systems, but use drip hoses and hand watering. And I think you did go over some of that. In the I, essentially, you're going to do the same thing, but you're just going to have to manually go out there and turn it on and off. So, you know, if you're using a, 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 a soaker hose, it's going to be a similar type pr principle. You know, get your hose out there, move it around to where you're needing it. If you've got basically a drip system that's a manually operated one, go out there, turn it on and off as well. But what you really want to be doing is putting the water down on the soil, not through a spray nozzle, um, because you're wanting to get the water right where the roots are and get it down as deep. If you're spraying the water, there's a lot of it that is getting oversprayed and not getting to where you want and evaporating before it even hits the ground. So putting the, the water down onto the soil right where you need it is really what you want to be doing. Okay, so the next one, someone asked, I think it was we were talking about, they asked about how deep, how deep did Lois say to dig the wedge, that wedge? As deep as your shovel blade can go. I mean, ideally it would be going down to about a foot. Yes, those trees, the majority of their roots are gonna be down two feet, but who wants to dig two feet? Are you really gonna do that? We think that if you, we can get you to get your shovel down, the blade down as deep as you can get it, eight to 12 inches and then feel, it should give you a pretty good feel whether you've got moist soil down that deep or not. Okay. Um, We're trying to make it so it's reasonable for you to do and not, not so cumbersome that you're gonna say, oh heck, I'm not doing it. We're <laughs> trying, to, trying to give you a fairly easy way to work with. There is a tool out there called a core or a, and, and in that watering brochure guideline that we have as one of our uh, references on the handout, the picture on the front page of it shows a soil core. If you wanted to spend $35 or more to get one of those, you'd be able to bring up a soil core and look at how deep the water is getting. 
Yeah, and I think one of our presenters in the last um, workshop, a few workshops ago, showed us the, the core, the, um, how to do it and had an example of it as well, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you think about um, a tree a root watering stake? They, um, from what the research that UC has done, they have not found them particularly effective because it only gets water close to where that is emitted. It's much better to get it put in with multiple uh, sources of water all around the canopy instead of at one location. Mm -hmm. So do you recommend using a moisture meter, the use of a moisture meter? You can use it if you would like. Um, I kind of think that it's a waste of money. I think your fingers work really, really well. Um, can you speak to, uh, to water needs of newer, um, like six-month-old plants when they can be, con when can they can be, when can they be considered mature? Oh, very good question. And I should, I'm just going to make a quick note on here about that. So I should be addressing that every time. When do plants mature? When, normally we call this an establishment period. Mm -hmm. And it usually takes plants at least a year and up to three years to become established. I would say err on the side of about three, at least two. Um, they're for perennial type plants. What they often say with perennials is that the first year you put them in, they sleep. They look like they're not doing anything. But what they're doing is they're trying to build their root system. And the second year that they're in there, they say that they creep. They start foraging out a little bit more. They get a little bit bigger. And they're, you, they're still sending their roots out a little bit more, but you can't see it. But the, the top part is getting a little bigger. It's looking better. The third year, they just go gangbusters. So that's the year we say they leap. So they sleep, they creep, then they leap. Think of toddlers. That's kind of how they work too. So... It, you know, instead of uh, having your, your, your baby take uh, until their teens to get established and be able to be on their own, plants are in the neighborhood of two to three years, so. A good yeah. way to think about it, too. <laughs> um, so um, what about a newly planted Ceanothus, a coffee berry, or a, and an Arcto... Arctostabilis. Yeah, during the droughts. <laughs> okay. I would say these kind of plants are really, you know, in Marin County or our climate here, the best time to plant is in the fall, right when the rains start to come as well. The days are shorter, there are less water needs. It gives the plant a lot better opportunity to try and get those root systems down and, um, and not be stressed from the summer heat as well. You are going to need to give them some additional water, but these plants are all native plants that want to uh, be a little bit dry. Better to be a little dry than a little wet. Ceanothus really doesn't live very long in gardens often because it gets too much water. But you're gonna wanna basically do what we're talking about here is use your Use your shovel to deal with the, the determining how deep your moisture is. You're going to want to get that water deep and then let it dry out a bit. But you're not going to want to get it to the point where it's really dry. You need to have some moisture still in it. So if you're watering, you know, the root systems are still small. They're only, you know, when you first put them in, they're probably only about a foot deep. So you're going to need to keep them having, you know, moisture that first year down to the, you know, the, the, the foot depth, but moist, but not wet and a little bit getting a little on the dry side before you give it its next drink. And you're going to need to keep moving that irrigation system for them out as they get bigger as well, because you want that irrigation system out at the canopy edge on the top. So I hope that ans answers your question. Somebody had any special instructions for fig trees? 
Well, they're a fruit tree. So fruit, um, with fruit trees, you're going to, you know, we talked about them a little bit, that you need to going to keep them watering. But fruit, remember when the plant is setting its fruit and growing it, getting its, you need to give it enough water while it's actually setting its fruit and developing its size. You, and they can start getting cut back a little bit on water if necessary once they start to develop color and are no longer developing their size. So fruit trees tend to need more water than some other trees and they're gonna need, need it very consistently as well. It's the same for like tomatoes. You're gonna keep giving them water while they're developing their size and as they start to color, you can start cutting back on the water so that they develop their taste. Okay. Um, should one water trees at drip line only or, and not at the base of the tree trunk? You're going to want to, you're not going to water right at the base of the tree trunk. That just doesn't get the water out to where those root tips are. Mm -hmm. The root tips out at the edges are where the, the feeder roots are, the little fine ones are. So you know, watering, ideally you'd be not doing it right at the base of the tree, but you'd start doing it several feet out from it and all the way out to the canopy drip line. We recognize that's difficult in a lot of situations, but if you can get it out near the canopy drip line, you'll do pretty well. Okay, and then someone's, uh, I think Lynn's asking with a, a soaker hose, sounds like it should be below the compost mulch. Ideally, that would be really nice, but you know, if you're only doing it once a month, you may want to just sort of lay it down there and then pick it back up. So um, it keeps it from getting clogged by dirt and silt that way. And you know, you're not you're not using it out there a whole lot. So you're, you've got it right down there at the soil level. Make sure you're going to want to then, when you deal with how, how deep did the water get, you're going to want to pull the mulch away before you put your spade in because you shouldn't be uh, counting the mulch layer with how deep your root, your water is getting. Okay. So someone's asking about irrigating a madrone tree during the drought. That would be like talking about the Ceanothus and the Arctostaphylus and the other plant that you have, uh, the coffee berry. Mm -hmm. it, it's a native plant. You're going to water it like a tree, but you're going to make sure the watering is deep and infrequent. So pretty much the practices we've talked about here today. Okay. And then the last question is, what is your best advice for watering trees and shrubs on a very steep grade that is loose soil covered with ivy? Well, I think you do best to get, see what you can do about um, building some kind of a little basin on your slope that protects it. Uh, the water give, gives yourself a little basin that you can water into and then dig it out a little bit on the back side of it and put the emitter for your irrigation on the upside of the uh, tree as far back as you can get it so that it is watering and has a little bit of room to deal with the runoff before it gets out of the basin. So, and it's, the water runs downhill. So if you can get it on the upside of the basin, then you'll do, it'll work its way down into the lower side of the basin as well. May need to be irrigating a little higher above it as well. Well, that was the last question. Thank you, Lois, and thank you everybody for sticking with this. I know there were some sound issues on most people's side, but on my side for the recording, it's really done, the sound I had no issues. So um, I'll be sending out a link to the recording later on today. Uh, you did fine, Lois, so you're okay. <laughs> so hopefully if you missed a bit of it, it'll be in the recording and you'll be able to um, to hear it, but I'll, I'll be also sending out the, the links in a document that Lois has shared with us and surveys for the Master Gardener. So thank you everybody for joining us and we'll see you next time. So thank you again, Lois, you have a great afternoon. Thank you, Franklin, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.